turns out that after more than 30 years as a lawyer, I am still Terry and Ina's daughter and David and Mark's little sister. <laughs> um, I guess you don't need any more proof that uh, families endure and that there's a huge power to them. Um, receiving an award named uh, for Thurgood Marshall is just completely humbling. Um, as I sat down to write tonight's remarks, I wanted them to be worthy of his example and to express the award's intent to advance the cause of equal justice. Uh, over the three decades of my legal career, I've seen how long-standing structural racism has led DC to be a city in which the overwhelming majority of kids and families living in poverty are black and brown, and that the fight for equal justice is first a fight for access to justice. That's why it... It's why it's also an honor to be introduced by Jim Sandman, who has made access to justice a reality for so many, and who speaks so passionately about justice as shelter and safety, family, and basic human dignity. Um, usually when I speak, I tell my audience about Makia or Ms. Harris or another one of the thousands of clients that Children's Law Center has had the privilege to work with, but I only have five minutes. So I'm going to ask you to do my work for me. Take a moment to think about a client you've represented. What did justice mean to them? And what would have happened if you weren't there to represent them? This audience is full of lawyers who have taken action, who've handled pro bono matters, advocated for changes in our profession, made a career of public service. You have chosen not to sit on the sidelines. You've gotten into the game of justice, and yet today we are still a city that is so far from being a place in which all residents have shelter, safety, and access to legal assistance, despite all of our collective hard work. Why? I believe a key reason is the wealth and income gap. So let me just illustrate how far that gap has widened. As Jim said, my father passed away earlier this year, and looking through his papers, I found a letter from 1959 offering him a job at a major law firm. He was clerking for the Supreme Court at the time. The salary he was offered, $9,000 a year. So in today's dollars, that's just under $89,000. Back in 1959, the federal minimum wage was one dollar an hour. As an annual salary, that would be two thousand dollars, and in today's dollars, that's about twenty thousand. So doing the math, the minimum wage in adjusted dollars is only 50 percent higher today than it was in 1959. But a first-year associate without a clerkship makes 250 percent more, and a Supreme Court clerk going to a big law firm with a signing bonus is paid 600% more now than in 1959. But let's forget history for a moment. Here's today's reality. If a DC resident works full time at minimum wage, they make at best $30,000. A law firm associate in their very first year of practice makes seven times that, more than 200,000. Partners, I'll let you fill in your share. <laughs> Justice goes beyond our time in the courtroom, beyond representing a low-income client. How we build our legal institutions matters. Simply by being lawyers in this city, we are all already in the game. What does that have to do with lawyer compensation? Now I'm going to say something hard to hear. Those increased salaries, they don't just cost your corporate clients. They actually reduce access to justice for low-income children and families. How, you might ask. One reason is that wealthier people spend their money. They can afford to pay more for childcare, to pay more to buy a home. And it is one thing for a legal services lawyer to choose to take fewer vacations abroad and eat out less often it is quite another thing to forego stable housing and having children because rent or childcare is too high. 
but these basic opportunities are increasingly out of reach for my colleagues because private lawyers have helped to drive up the cost of living in this community. So legal organizations like mine do their best to raise salaries, but unless they bring in more revenue, that means they hire fewer lawyers, which reduces access to justice. And what about children and families living in poverty? Unlike people who have the means, children and families living in poverty, they can't purchase their way out of challenging situations. They turn to family, neighbors, and public agencies for help. And when all else fails, they turn to legal services. What am I suggesting? Something very basic. That if you choose to make a higher salary, it isn't charity to share your wealth. It's justice. that fighting for justice means funding justice. The economics of law has an impact on justice. And all of us, whether we want to or not, are a part of it. You know, I use first year associate salaries to make a point, but this applies to all lawyers. I mean, I may not work at a big law firm, but I certainly make a lot more money than our clients do. And so do law firm partners. I plan to begin these remarks by talking about the legal giants like Justice Marshall, on whose shoulders I stand. But as I said earlier, I only have five minutes, and I'm sure I've used them up already. Um, tomorrow, I go back to work with my almost 100 colleagues at Children's Law Center, two of whom, Tracy Goodman and Shara Greer, are here with me tonight. The truth is, I take credit for my colleagues' successes every day. Um, and if I'm worthy of this award, it's because we earned it together. I couldn't look them in the eye if I didn't speak up for justice tonight. I've learned over the years that when it comes to justice, parents and youth are among our most tenacious fighters. And if I had time, I could name so many, but tonight I'm going to only name one who's here with me, which is my older son, Antonio. He gave me permission to share that I met him after he spent several years in foster care, um, and he has taught me so much about healing and courage, and he is now a wonderful father to my grandchildren. Of course, the cause of justice is faster with the right policymakers. And leaders like DC Council Chair Phil Mendelson, Attorney General Kyle Racine, and Chief Judge Andy Jose Herring are also with, here with me tonight. Each of them has used their position to expand access to justice. But I know that they will understand that I'm going to end with this. Each of them and each of us has an obligation by virtue of our profession and our position to fight for justice, to fund justice, and to do justice. Thank you. Thank you.